In this video, it's going to be an introduction to transits. We're going to look at the first three steps that you need to take when you start to do transit interpretations. This is for forecasting astrologers. Hi, if we haven't met before, I'm Alison, an astrologer in Vancouver. When you start to do forecasting work, transits would be the first thing that you tend to look for. The transits are the actual planetary positions that are happening right now. So if it's a full moon for me, it's a full moon for you. And if Jupiter went into Aquarius for me, it went into Aquarius for you. These are what's actually happening, where the planets are, and it's constantly moving. What we're going to do in this video is go through the three steps you need to take to, to get out the information from a chart, from the transits, so that you can start to prepare the interpretation for your client. Transits are a part of the direct forecasting methods of astrology and the other method that's direct is um, solar returns and you can see more information about that there. I am actually creating a transits series or playlist. This was the, actually the first video in the transit series and as more videos come along in the next few weeks you'll be able to go back and watch them all on this link here. And just by the way the indirect forecasting methods are secondary progressions and solar arc directions which is a talk for another day. So most astrologers start with transits. In fact, the backbone of astrological forecasting is transit work. And some astrologers will even only ever use transits and never step into other forecasting techniques. And it's, it's, it really is a personal choice. But everyone starts with transits and everyone really does need to understand how transits work. If you found value in this video, please do consider subscribing, give me a like or share it with someone who would be interested. So let's get started. So introduction to transits for forecasting astrologers. When you're working with transits, basically you have a transit chart. And in our case, in this example, we're going to be using today's chart, which is January the 3rd, 2021. I've set the chart there for uh, dawn, just as the sun is breaking over the horizon, which is to me is a great chart anyway. So these, this is the chart of what the planets are doing right now. And you then compare your transit chart against a birth chart, which is clearly the chart for your birth. And the example I'm going to be using for this particular video is for uh, Prince William, and that's his chart there. So your birth chart remains the same, but the transit chart will be moving. Now, typically you would use a bi-wheel in astrology when you're working with transit. So a bi-wheel means there are two wheels, and the inner wheel will have the birth chart and the outer wheel will have the transit chart. And if you look there at the notes on the top left, it says William's chart. That's his birth details. That is the inner wheel. And then the transit chart on the top right specifies that it, we're, the transit chart we're working with is, of course, today's January the 3rd. And that is your outer wheel. So you use a bi wheel. And when you're using bi wheels, you always want to put the natal chart in the middle because the transits will pass over your natal planets and, and make the changes, implications and uh, suggestions that transits do. So when working with transits, step one will be you're looking for planets transiting natal houses. So in his particular case, we're looking at the first house and we see there are a few planets. He's got the Sun, Mercury, Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter, and that is actually five planets currently transiting through his first house. So this will be definitely stimulating the, um, the first house for him, which is, of course, his personality, um, how people see him, who he is, his physical body, what he looks like, and all the rest of it. Then looking at his second house, he only has Neptune transiting through the second house, and Neptune will have been there for a long time, many years, this is a theme that he's been working with for a long time, and it's not something you're necessarily going to be wanting to talk about immediately. Looking at his third house, he has Chiron and Mars transiting through his third house. Chiron looks like it's recently moved in there, and Mars has been there for a good six to eight months probably, and it will be changing soon, as we'll see. Then the fourth house, he has uh, Uranus, and we can see clearly that that planet has only recently entered his fourth house, maybe uh, late last year, and it's got a good couple of years in his fourth house to make changes and reformations for him. Then the fifth house, he has no transiting planets in his fifth house. So basically what this means is that the fifth house area of his life, which is to do, as you know, with children, um, risk, 
gambling, entertainment, your leisure activities, your sporting and so on. There's nothing really happening there. There's no nothing to be concerned about either. So his sixth house, he actually doesn't have a planet, but he does have the North Node. So we would consider that. And again, that's been there for a while, but it's definitely in the sixth house of work. His seventh house, again, he has no planets in the seventh house. So we can assume that he's unlikely to get married or divorce for that matter. And that basically his serious, his main serious relationship is just ticking away without concern because there are no planets there irritating or stimulating his seventh house. Then we look at the eighth house and at the moment he has the moon. Now, of course, typically the moon will only be two or three days in one house. This is fleeting and generally you would not really look at the moon for transits, but it is in the transit chart that we're explaining at the moment. That's why I'm mentioning it now. But this will definitely be a fleeting mood change and things going on in that area. Then in the ninth house, again, he has no planet. So that area of his life, he's not being stimulated or, or expanded or stretched or any, in any way at the moment. Similarly with the 10th house, no planets in his 10th house whatsoever so that area of his life will again be I don't want to say remain fallow but it's not the main focus for him at the moment and the 11th house too has no planets clearly there can't be planets in every house there are only 10 planets and there's 12 houses so for him again the 11th house is vacant and then we get to the 12th house and he's got the transiting south node and Venus so those are both in his 12th house we would consider Venus, um, definitely want to look at Venus, and the South Node will have been there for a quite a while. Then you want to look at transiting planets that are changing house soon. So we take a closer look at this by wheel and we see that clearly the Moon will change house within two or three days. It's not really important, but we are mentioning it. Uh, Venus will be changing house, Mars will, and so will Jupiter. And I've just highlighted those four planets with the red circles and you can see that these planets are moving towards the end of a house they are towards the cusp of a new house and clearly Venus will enter the first house perhaps in a week or two it will cross his ascendant that's a transit to pay attention to Venus can join the ascendant you want to be concerned about that you would want to then talk about as Venus enters his first house what he's likely to attract into his life um, love and finances how they are going to affect him personally as well then you would look at the mars the mars is there in at the very tail end of the third house it will it has been in the third house a long time and it will then eventually move into the fourth house and cross over the ic so that's one aspect as well you will have mars conjoined ic mars enters fourth house but the main aspect actually is going to be mars opposition midheaven so there will be challenges to his outside world life during that time. So that would be the main concern as Mars slips into his fourth house. And then the last one will be Jupiter, although Jupiter still has a few, quite a few degrees to go. It's only three degrees today and his cusp is at 12. So he's got a good nine degrees. But during the course of 2021, Jupiter will enter his second house for sure bringing expansion to his basically second house uh, finances self-worth and so on things are likely to grow and develop and get bigger as jupiter passes through his second house so these are the only four planets that are changing house soon and you want to pay attention to that the third step is looking at the transiting aspects to the natal chart so when we're looking at transiting aspects, the orbs I use are one degree applying and one degree separating for all aspects. So even though a conjunction natally would be eight degrees, when you're talking about transits, you're using one degree. And this will apply to all aspects, but specifically all the major Ptolemaic aspects, the conjunction, opposition, trine, square and sextile. They're the ones we're going to be looking at. So you want to use an aspect grid, which is a handy, handy dandy grid. And across the top on the X axis is the birth chart. So William's uh, planets are across the top. And then the Y axis shows, which is the vertical side, shows the transiting planets as they are moving. So the transiting planets will aspect the birth chart. It's not the other way around. If we look at the outer planet aspects, which is really where you start, this is Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. We want to see which of these three outer planets are transiting his chart. 
And the only one of note is actually Pluto is squaring Pluto. And this is a huge note, actually. William is of the generation where Pluto, he was born when Pluto was moving swiftly through Scorpio. So it is able to whip round the zodiac to form a square to itself. Now, previous generations would never have experienced Pluto square Pluto because Pluto does take 240 odd years to go around the zodiac. So that's at least 120 years to do half half of it and you're really looking at your 60s or 70s before you can even consider having a Pluto square so it just that generation is now living through Pluto square Pluto and this has to be the main thing this is the most important thing the most important transit he has at the moment and there's the actual chart wheel diagram you can see transiting Pluto is applying a square to natal Pluto and there it is with the red line Let's look at the middle planet aspect. So your middle planets are Mars, Jupiter, Saturn and Chiron. And so what have we got? We've got Chiron is squaring the moon and Saturn is sextile Uranus. Middle planet Chiron is making a square to his moon. We would pay attention to that for sure. And Saturn is sextile Uranus. You'd want to look into that one. If we look at it actually now on the chart, we can see there's the Chiron square to his moon and there is the Saturn sextile in blue to the Uranus. So you can see which way the energy is going from the transiting planet into the natal chart. Taking it another step, we would then look at the inner planet aspects. Of course, these are fleeting, but we're looking at transits in general, so I'm going to cover it here. So we do have the moon is square Mercury and the sun is opposition, the north node. Now, the moon square Mercury will be a very fleeting aspect. It is likely to last a maximum of about four hours in one day today. And it just so happens to be in, in orb as we are looking at this particular chart. But in general, you would dismiss that. It's just too much information. So with the Sun opposition North Node, the Sun will be in orb for around two days. So you've got, because it moves at one degree a day, so it'll be one degree applying, one degree separating, therefore one day applying, one day separating, creating this opposition to the North Node. But technically, although the Sun is opposing the North Node, and that is what the grid has shown us, what I would focus on at this point would be that the Sun is actually conjoined the South Node, which is more important, really, where the stimulation is coming. These are inner planets that are fleeting, the Moon for a couple of hours, the Sun for a couple of days, and technically within transits you wouldn't necessarily pay attention to these. But they are here because this is how you work with transits. So bringing that all together as a bit of a summary, all the current Ptolemaic aspects that he has that are transiting aspects to his natal chart are Pluto square Pluto, the most important, Chiron square Sun, Saturn sextile Uranus. Those are the three that I would totally concentrate on. The fact that the Moon is square Mercury and the Sun is opposition to the Northern Node is by the by, but the main three occurring for him specifically through January will be the Pluto, the Chiron and the Saturn. So those are the important things to look at and interpret for him right now. So your transit introduction one, two, three steps are step one, find planets transiting natal houses. Step two, find transiting planets changing house soon. And step three is find transiting aspects to the natal chart. These are the main things that you're looking for in transit work. Okay, so quite a lot of information there. Now you have the three steps you require to extract transit information so you can gather your thoughts before you start doing interpretations. So I'd like to know from you, what is your most important Ptolemaic transit aspect happening in the near future? I'm Alison Price. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.